Let's talk about memory errors and eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony can be the most compelling form of evidence. The more confident an eyewitness appears, the more convincing they seem. Loftus and Doyle wanted to see how compelling eyewitness testimony actually is, and so they set up the following experiment. They set up a mock trial that had the exact same evidence, but one set of jurors had an eyewitness. In the case where there was no eyewitness, only 18% found the defendant guilty. However, with the exact same information but an eyewitness, 72% of people said that the defendant was guilty. So the mere presence of having an eyewitness changed it from being a 20% chance of guilt to almost a three quarters of a chance of guilt. To examine this further, another experiment was set up by Cutler and Penrod in 1995. They made their actor do a memorable action in a convenience store. For example, they went in and they paid for about $20 worth of items in pennies. So this should obviously stick out in the mind of the um, people in the store. It's very unusual. The other thing to note was that the circumstances were highly favourable. So the purported criminal was in the convenience store for a long time. So they were in there for quite a good duration and it had good visibility. So the participant didn't have any uh, hoodies or any kind of thing cloaking their face. Um, and it was in daylight. So great conditions, basically, for this criminal activity or this uh, interesting activity to occur. They then asked uh, the onlookers to identify the person in like a lineup situation. About 34 to 48% of people correctly identified the person that did this memorable action. But at the same time, 34 to 48% of people also incorrectly identified someone else. So what this tells us is that even in the best circumstances, daylight, uh, you could see the person, they did something very, very obvious to you, we only have a 50-50 chance really of identifying the correct person. Another experiment. Um, participants viewed a security videotape and there was a gunman on there and they watched him for eight seconds. They were then given a lineup. Everyone identified the gunman from the photographs even though the actual gunman's picture was not there. So everyone identified the, uh, the criminal, but he wasn't in the lineup. In yet another experiment on the errors we make in eyewitness testimony, uh, Danny and Johnson wanted to see how arousal affected how we report our memories. And basically, if we have too much attention or too little attention, that can affect how much we remember. So if we have low attention, we're not really paying attention to anything. But at the same time, if our attention is too high, our focus can be too narrow. So the best amount of attention is kind of somewhere in between. Um, you can pay attention to what's irrelevant around you. What they noticed was something that's called weapons focus. Uh, when someone uses a weapon in a criminal activity, it narrows the attention. So to examine this a bit further, they did an experiment what they call the shoot and no shoot condition. So basically they set up a um, pretend criminal activity and in one, in the shoot condition, the person had a gun and of course in the second setup they had no gun, the no shoot condition. And this is what they found. As you can see from the graph, the blue here is the no shoot condition. And in all three situations that they're remembering about the weapon, about the victim, and about the perpetrator, their memory recall is much higher. So with the presence of the weapon, they remembered less information about the perp, about the victim, and even they remembered less information about any weapons that were present. So the presence of the gun 
decreases how much information is remembered. Another problem in eyewitness testimony is familiarity. A psychologist called Dr. Donald Thompson was actually a very well-known memory researcher. And he was currently on t television talking about his research in memory errors. At the same time, a lady was watching him on the TV and a, another man broke into her house and assaulted her. She later implicated Donald Thompson as her attacker. So of course, luckily, he had an alibi. He was on TV at that time, giving an interview about memory errors uh, and couldn't have been her attacker. But the mere fact that she had been watching him on TV as she uh, was being attacked led her to believe that he was her attacker. Her memory uh, was fa uh, false. And similarly, another um, real life scenario, a train ticket agent was robbed one day. Um, he implicated a sailor, but luckily that person had an alibi. It was someone else. Uh, they realised later that the sailor he, who he had said attacked the train ticket agent looked familiar. He had lived nearby and he came to the train uh, station quite often. It wasn't that the t train ticket agent was purposely trying to be deceptive. It's just that when recalling his memory, he thought of someone that he had known and seen before quite often. It's also very important that once we have developed a memory, the information that we receive afterwards can also have an effect on how accurately we recall information. This is what is called the misinformation effect. Sometimes if we get misleading information after a person witnesses event, it can change how we describe the event later. To investigate this, Loftus did a very well-known experiment. She showed two groups of people a different video. One showed the, uh, a video of two cars uh, colliding and um, asked them afterwards either about how fast were they hit, so were the cars going when they hit each other, and to a second group who watched the same video, she asked about how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. So a simple change of that word from hit to smash. And then they had to identify or give an approximate speed. For those participants that were asked how fast were they going when they hit each other, they said about 34 miles an hour. For those participants that were asked how fast were they going when they smashed into each other, they estimated about 41 miles per hour. So they saw the exact same video that change of word from hit to smash made the second group believe that the cars were going a lot faster. And similarly, when they were asked about a week later to recall the, um, the incident, they were asked how many of them can remember seeing any smashed glass. In the hit situation, only 14% of people reported seeing broken glass. But in the smashed condition, 32, so over double, 32% uh, of people reported seeing broken glass. It's interesting to note that there was no broken glass in the original video. So once again, just having that question after they'd watched the video, how fast the cars when they smashed into each other, had a direct impact on how people recalled the memory. So simple suggestion errors can have an effect on people's memory. This can also lead to the types of questions that policemen ask when they're trying to get the uh, testimony from their eyewitness. For example, leading the witness by saying, did you see the white car? Suggests that there was actually a white car in play. Uh, or which one of these men did it in the lineup suggests that someone in that lineup actually did do it. Um, so perhaps there wasn't a white car or perhaps there, one of the men isn't in the lineup. But the simple wording of that question might believe people that they do that. 
Similarly, just a simple okay from the um, police officer can influence the witness into thinking that they've correctly identified a suspect. A simple nod or a uh uh-huh can be all it needs to kind of give some confirming feedback to the witness. So on the whole, jurors really rely heavily on eyewitness identification. But as you've seen, there's been quite a lot of research shows that our memory is highly fallible. Wells in 1998 went back and looked at 40 cases where DNA had later changed the conviction. And in 90% of those cases, it was due to mistaken eyewitness identification. And in one case, there were five eyewitnesses. So we put a lot of stock into eyewitness testimony. But in fact, we see that human memory is really full of errors. So my last question for you is, what is being done to improve eyewitness recall?